Hi, my name is Jerry Fialka. Today is July 18, 2021. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here with Kavi. Kavi, please tell me your last name so we have it on the tape pronounced Z correctly. Zahedi. Zahedi. Kavi, is that right? No. <laughs> tell me. Kave. Kave. I am so sorry. That's okay. I appreciate you. Kave. Okay. First question is, what is the best thing for a human being? The best thing? Yeah. For a human being? Yeah. Uh, to love and be loved. Do you know where that line's from? No. So, to love and be loved, what is the best thing for a human being? Well, it's amazing because I just wrote an article about it. Eden Abes, sorry to go off on a tangent, but Eden Abes was first hippie. In the 40s ish, he lived on the Venice boardwalk <clears throat> where they're trying to kick off all the homeless people right now. He was homeless. He wrote this song, Nature Boy, which is uh, the, the hit that made Nat King Cole his career. And that's the line in it, to love and be loved. So uh, it's quite amazing he said that. And I just, you know, closer. wrote an article about that. So it was <clears throat> how appropriate. What's your favorite form of information? How information comes into you? Oh, I love audio. You love audio. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I like listening to things. Yeah. Why do you think humans collect or gather information? Uh, I find it stimulating. Like, it makes me feel, like, excited and and more alive. Yeah. Do you think this need or want to collect information is innate or uh, invented? Is it hardwired in humans or is it invented by humans? I don't know. Um, I just know that I I have it, and I know people have it in different degrees. I know astrologically, like it's like a Gemini-ish thing, and I have my moon in Gemini, so I think my desire for information has to do with my Gemini moon. And I know this guy who's like a triple Gemini, and he's like way more into information than I am. So I think it's like uh, like different people have different amounts of it, but I have quite a bit of it. Yeah. Do thoughts create emotions? Yes. Nothing but thoughts create emotions, I think. Fill in the blank. I don't know what I think until I've... Tried it. Tried it? Oh, I've never had that answer. Very good. <laughs> Did humans... Is, is thinking more innate or more invented? Innate. Oh, invented. I don't know. That's a good question. Depends what you mean by thinking. Depends on what you mean by thinking, yeah. And then, can uh, can we think without language? No. Do you more pursue happiness or more pursue meaning? I pursue meaning, but I would like to switch to happiness. <laughs> really? When are you going to switch, you think? Uh, hopefully right now. Ah, right now. Be here now. Does the brain more detect consciousness or create consciousness? You know, is consciousness there just bubbling away? Create. It creates it. Yeah. What's faster, speed of light or speed of thought? Probably light. <laughs> you can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. That's Audre Lorde said that. Yvonne Rayner responded, you can if you expose the tools. What new tool do you suggest or propagate or hoik up? Uh, transparency and, and uh, self-reflection. Wait, suss, suss that out. What do you mean by transparency? Well, kind of like what Yvonne Rayner is saying about the, the showing the tools. But I think if you show everything, then you're doing something new. Right. And the second part was transparency and your other new tool. Self-reflection, which is including the transparency thing as a mode of reflection. I forgot the question, actually. No, that was good. It was what new tool do you suggest? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, you had two new tools. That's great. Yeah. What do you worry about when you go to bed at night?
I guess my kids having a happy long life. Yeah. Marshall McLuhan learned from Ezra Pound that artists are the antenna of the race. They're broadcasting and receiving the hidden psychic effects of the things that we invent. So McLuhan's pers percept probing his percept was why do humans still ignore the hidden psychic effects or as you use the words other context if we can look to the artists filmmakers writers to reveal them to us why do people ignore them yeah because um it's easier to ignore them than not to right okay you almost asked that at like a question. Are you certain? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm certain of anything. You're not certain of anything? Thank God. No, it's like the Irish um, guy goes, you Irish answer questions with a question. They go, we do, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, are humans more feeling beings or more thinking beings? Just in general, I know it's both. Thinking. We're more thinking beings. Yeah. I mean, I wish we were more feeling beings. Yeah, Bridget Bardot says, when I make love, I don't think. I'm like, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can you stop thinking when you make love? No. Can you stop thinking when you're doing anything? Maybe at the moment of orgasm, I'm not really exactly thinking. Oh, dude, that was a great, great thing to evoke. Can you come and laugh at the exact same moment? No. Can any human? I, I've not met them. <laughs> I'm not. Are you more afraid of new ideas or more afraid of old ideas? Old ideas? Yeah. Can you, uh, can you conjure up your earliest memory ever? I have a memory of a memory, but I don't know if it's accurate. Yeah, well, can you tell us about it? Oh, yeah. I remember walking down the street in Iran and hearing a gunshot and thinking, I wonder if someone just shot a bird and then a dead bird fell at my feet. Is memory more a curse or more a blessing? Blessing. Can you tell me an early role model within your immediate family, someone who had an impact on you, and what specifically was that impact? Immediate family? Yeah, in, in your immediate family. Then it's going to be outside your immediate family. Okay, my dog. And what was the impact, basically? Just that there was such a thing as unconditional love. Oh. <laughs> At what point have you felt unconditional love in your life besides that moment? Is there any... Is Just any, my own unconditional love for my children. Nice. You're giving it out, but if you felt it other than the dog. No. Wow. So outside your immediate family, tell me someone who made an impact on you. Rambo? The movie character played by... <laughs> no, Arthur. Huh? Arthur Rambo. Oh, <laughs> Rimbo, I thought. Is it, is it Rambo? In French, it's Rambo. Is it really? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to insinuate. That's how dumb I am. That's like uh, this guy told me he went to the oldest college in the history of the world, university. He's in Italy or something. Right? Went to medical school. He was telling me his romantic recollection of it. And he goes, have you ever seen La Dolce Vita? And I goes, yeah. He says, I live La Dolce Vita. So the next day, I thought, what could I have come back with him? Uh -huh. Like, come back line. And I'd say, have you ever seen Dumber Dumber? <laughs> <laughs> now, I've never even seen Dumber Dumber, but I just thought it would have been a great comeback. <laughs> like, sorry about that. Okay, so um, what did what was the impact this poet had on you? What age are you reading him? Mm, maybe like around 13, 14. Um, I mean, he had an impact over many years but at that time I don't know just like this this sort of like freedom to transgress so you want to talk about that what is what does it mean to transgress 
Which is not to follow the rules. Yeah. And to do it knowing that you're breaking the rules. Yeah. So is he, it, were you young getting into him? Because, I mean, isn't he, is he a symbolist? Yeah, he's considered a symbolist. Yeah, he's probably like one of the first symbolists. He's considered the most important symbolist. Yeah. <laughs> Who's the second? Mallarmé. Yeah. Boy, you know your stuff, don't you? So who'd they get their stuff from? Baudelaire. And who'd he get his stuff from? Um, who did Baudelaire get his stuff from? Hugo? How about Poe? Oh, yeah, Poe. Poe, too? Yeah. Who'd they, who would they get it for first, Poe or Hugo? Say, are they the same time? Yeah, I think so. Wow. So, um, Dylan, all the rock poets, Dylan Morrison, Patti Smith, and Kurt Cobain, sort of come out of the symbols. But they're reading Rimbaud later. When do you think they're hitting him up in the 16 and you got him in the 13? Yeah, but I mean, I kept reading them. I mean, I, I still read them. Right, but did you grow up a reader? Yeah. Did you read because your parents were reading? They gave you the example, they told you to read, or on your own? I read because my mom seemed to think that that was cool and I wanted her to like me. The the act of reading? Yeah. <laughs> so who, who before 13 was having an impact on your reading? Well, my mom, just in the sense that, you know, I wanted to impress her. Right, but I mean, who, what authors? Oh, uh, well, Hugo. You're reading at 13 or before 13? Yeah. What'd you get from him? Um, just like empathy with the poor. <laughs> really? And so when I ask you how, what... What's your favorite form of information? How it comes into you? What did you say? Audio. Where do you rate reading? Oh, I like books on tape. Where do you rate film? Very low. Really? Even though if we met at a, a cocktail party and I says, hey, what do you do? What would you say? I'm a filmmaker. You're like... Another overrated filmmaker, in my opinion, is Kenneth Anger. Oh, yeah. You agreed? Yeah. <laughs> he said, he goes, the day humans invented cinema was a black day for mankind. Did you ever hear that line? Yeah. That is great. So, Are we doing this for 90 minutes? You're going to ask questions like this for 90 minutes? Is it okay? <laughs> okay, yeah. sure. But, I mean, you can expand. Right? Okay. And, you know, which, which, yeah. <clears throat> Have you seen the show about the show? I haven't. I'm sorry to say. That's okay. And I know I should have. I watched a couple of your interviews. I'm sorry. I really apologize. Yeah. That's okay. I know the premise, and I, I'm familiar with your films a little, not a lot, and I should be more familiar, and I apologize. So, That's okay. Yeah. But you know, I'm doing a Kickstarter uh, season right now of the show. I'm trying to raise money for the show, and so like I'm trying to like do a bunch of like podcasts and stuff right now because of that right well any of this you want to use and edit that's fine but i mean basically this is just like a formulaic 90 minute thing and you can you can definitely delve into your answers longer but it's fine if you don't you okay can, it's it's all up to you to put everything into the context you want okay so you know so anyways did your parents raise you a particular religion no i mean secular but my our neighbors were Mormon, so I used to go to Mormon Sunday school. So I know the Mormon cosmology. Yeah. And uh, do you pray? Kind of, not like formally. Yeah. That's probably the best kind of prayer, kind of praying. <laughs> um, if God exists, what do you want God to tell you after you die? Um... You did a great job. <laughs> Dude, as much as I've watched your interviews today, I would agree with them. You did a great job. Oh, thank you. You're very articulate. How do you think you formed your sensibility of being articulate? You feel confident with what you say. Hmm. I think I used to pretend to be 
incompetent or something. And then one day I sort of realized I was pretending. And I decided to like not pretend anymore. And so then I kind of like started again for real. And I think the key was like being okay with not knowing and not trying to pretend. Now, not knowing is very important, isn't it? So I think all artists try to get to that point of not knowing. And at what point in your life did you realize that, approximately? Well... Like age-wise? 20s? How do you think it came to you? Psychedelics. Nice. So, um, is, you know, the most watched TED Talk ever is Fake It to Make It? Is it sort of like that pre you were faking it to make it? Yeah. And then the psychedelics flipped you into, what would you call it? You don't need to make it. <laughs> That's a great answer. With all these great film students, are, you don't need to make it. How do you pay your rent? <laughs> See, that's the whole point. Was that a question? How do you pay your rent? Oh, yeah, you can answer that. Yeah, that's sort of facetiously just throw it out, but you can, you can answer it. Um, I don't know. I just know that the universe has supported me my whole life. Yeah. I don't know how, how or why, but yeah. it has. And I've always managed. Yeah. So I feel like there's a, a benevolent energy in the universe that helps us. But I know you talk about uh, Course of Miracles and Power of Positive Thinking. Is that partly it? Yeah. Yeah. It's attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, back to Inabas, this guy who lived on the Venice Boardwalk, sort of homeless, first hippie ever, you know, be careful on who you kick off the Venice Boardwalk. They might write the song that could heal us all. The most important thing is to love and to be loved. So, you know, there's a disconnect there. I watch people at the corner of Venice and Lincoln here every day on my bicycle waiting for the light to change and all the people in the cars who are competent and rich and jobs are tense and like Ugh. and the homeless guy in the corner has a smile on his face that goes what's wrong with this picture I mean go back to that Hugo epiphany you had from reading him empathy for was it poor what does that mean well, just for, for, I mean, like in Les Miserables and also in Hunchback of Notre Dame, like it's just this incredible empathy for the downtrodden, the dispossessed, the yeah. marginalized. Yeah. And it's like somebody who's sort of seeing them as in their humanity. And I mean, it's kind of old fashioned, <laughs> but it's like very, very humanist. I mean, he's just like, yeah, f feels deeply for others. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, it's it's divide and conquer. That's what they want to do. They want to say, you're homeless and you're not. And, you know, the beauty of Venice is Marina Del Rey is one side, Santa Monica is the other. Venice, you can have a millionaire movie director next to a homeless junkie and not tell the difference. Everywhere else you can. So, you know. Do, do evil people exist or does evil use people as a vehicle? The latter. Yeah. This question is, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? I'm going to set up with a few modern thinkers' thoughts. Alan Watts says, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Coppola stole from the mob and the samurais. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. JFK said, forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. Fellini said, I need an enemy. So the question is basically, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? But first, how would you respond to Alan Watts? If you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Well, I mean, I think if you call them your enemy, you empower their enemification of them. Yeah. But I think the, the your enemy is you, is the answer to that. Yeah. I mean, they're just you projected outwards the yeah. part of yourself that you don't accept and then you call that your enemy but they're just you're just hating yourself well you know that's an amazing statement because a homeless uh, skateboarder philosopher in Venice told me en ami 
is you're naming. Oh. When you name oh. someone, that's an. So, but it, how would you advise someone to deal with an enemy? Um, I guess recognize that they're your greatest teacher. I mean, this is Lao Tzu. Say what he says. He says, what is a good man but a bad man's teacher? Yeah. What is a bad man but a good man's job? I learned that uh, Shenandoah, uh, Dalai Lama quotes Shenandoah, says, your enemy is your best teacher. You have ESP. I was just going to say that line. You, th you think you have ESP? I think everyone has ESP. Yeah. James Joyce was the first projectionist in Dublin, Volta Cinema, over 100 years ago. He basically checked out. He said, this is stupid. Why should I go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when I can go outside and see a real tree? Years later, Faulkner said, sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism. Why do we have to recreate things in order to get them? Why do we have to go to a theatrical play of people acting out life? Why don't we just live life? Well, because a play puts a frame around it and puts it in a context where we can actually look at it without feeling implicated. And we don't have to give an answer. We can just be neutral and just let it in. We can listen. In real life, it's very hard to listen because you're, you're having to say something and you're not in that space of, of attention. So I think there's something very valuable about both films and theater and, and books for that same reason. Like it gives you a, a, a meditative space in which to let things uh, reverberate. How, how did you process becoming a good listener? What's the process of becoming a good listener? Well, I think you have to know that you don't know, otherwise you're not gonna ever listen to anything. And you have to become curious to know what you don't know, which is scary for most people. Um, so you have to overcome your fear of not knowing and your um, fear that you could do better and that you're not, you're, not, you're not already at your best. Yeah. Yeah, that still seems a big challenge because people want, for some reason, they want to pursue knowledge and they want to think they can learn and they can learn wouldn't you agree people can learn yeah okay so then the cliche is the journey is more important than the destination why do we have to seek a destination if the journey is more important well this is just a, a trick to get you to get off your ass and go on a journey <laughs> you mean a self-imposed trick yeah or, or, or a trick by the universe but it's just like a I think David Byrne said, like, lyrics are just a trick to get you to listen to music for longer than you would otherwise. It's kind of like that. It's just like uh, the journey helps you. The destination helps you get on the journey. Right. But then you got the flaneurs in Paris in the 20s. Psychogeography, you can wander aimlessly and stumble upon something. Yeah. I find it helpful to feel like I'm going somewhere, even if I don't get there. Yeah. Or... Or it's not where I thought I w was going. Yeah. Well, what first attracted you to pursue filmmaking? Um, the idea that it could combine art and politics. Really? What age are you? 18. What films were you seeing before 18 that had an impact on you? Anybody? Filmmakers or films? Planet of the Apes. What, what kind of impact did they have on you? Just like... There was a, 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 a uh, it was really just like a, a way to talk to bullies. A way to talk to bullies, yeah. Who's the screenwriter in that? That's, that must be good. I don't know. That's pretty good. The, a way to talk to bullies. That's back to how do you deal with an enemy almost. Like a way. Yeah, but it wasn't like a good way. It was just yeah. like oh, there the way they propose is not a good way. No, it was just a, a way to keep your dignity. And so, then at eighteen, you how did you become a political activist? Is that what, you're a political activist, right? Uh, I I wouldn't call myself that at the moment. But but at that point you were yeah yeah. What was the uh, motive there or what, what caused that you know I, I, I saw a Che Guevara t-shirt and I thought he was really handsome <laughs> and I wanted to be that guy 
And then I started reading about him, and then I realized, oh, this is whole history of colonialism and <laughs> exploitation yeah. that I didn't know about. And then I was just like, oh, this is this is not good. And then I just kind of got into trying to change the world. Do you know he was an uh, uh, extra in a Hollywood film? Either Che or the other guy. What, they're both they're both of them amazing little story. Um, I learned I couldn't believe it, but it's true. What's the other uh, Castro? Which one was an extra? These film students should know. I don't, Either I don't, Castro I don't, I don't or know. Che were in, was an were in, at one point was an extra in Hollywood. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So then. Uh, well, let's get into politics at some point, if you don't mind. But let's stay on film for a second. A screenwriting teacher told me a great film is when you can clearly see the intention of the maker. Stanley Kubrick says the opposite. Great film or great art is when you can clearly not see the intention of the maker. What role does intention play in your creative process? Well, your intention gets you somewhere. But I, I agree that your intention doesn't matter in the, in the end. It's just... Whatever the the text uh, suggests to you is what matters. I mean, like for example, Finnegan's Wake, right? Like uh, Joyce's intention in that book is, I think, secondary. <laughs> what's that book transcends Joyce's intentions? That's what's great about that book, is Joyce knows as he's writing it that there's more in that book than he can possibly understand himself, and and I my Joyce teacher told me that he thought of it as a book of prophecy and that it was uh, predictive of the future uh, and that there were things in it that hadn't happened yet that would happen later and that it was channeled. That it was a channeled text. And your Joyce teacher, who was? Mary Reynolds, who also wrote a book on Joyce and Dante. Oh, my God. That was at where? At Yale. At Yale. And so, um, can we stay on Finnegan's Wake for a while? What age did you get into the Wake? Or let's say, where where'd you get into Joyce first? Where'd in you start? In college. And you started with what book? Ulysses. And then from Ulysses, you went to? Finnegan. Finnegan's Wake? Yeah. So, you, you have you ever pursued all the rest of Joyce? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. And is that essential to read Finnegan's Wake? Is knowing all other Joyce essential? I mean, nothing is essential to reading Finnegan's Wake. I just think reading it is essential to reading it. Reading it out loud with a group of people? Or alone, or just, just reading it. Not necessarily out loud. Out loud is good. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a book that, you know, like, it works on your unconscious. Yeah. And it also works by, by accretion. And you start to What's notice things. Mean? Accretion? Yeah. Like, just adding one thing after another until it, it, it gets, it, you know, gets bigger and bigger. It, right. It, it, it accrues. Uh, it's like a, it's like in interest yeah. accrues to a Gr growth. Yeah. Yeah. But how much of uh, the weight do you think you understand percentage wise? Oh, one thousandth. One thousandth. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, a minuscule. Yes. But you've been studying it for how many years? Well, many years, but not not full time. Um, you know, it's just something that it's like a it's like a mountain that you like to hike up. Yeah. But it's not like you you have have encompassed the mountain. Yeah. Or understand all of its all of its you know valleys and and yeah. uh, protuberances. Yeah. How much do you think Joyce understood the way? Well, he understood it better than I do. But I mean, give <laughs> me a percentage. Just it's a joke. Oh oh question. oh, uh, you know. fifty. He understood fifty. You think? Yeah. How much do you think Mary Reynolds understood it? Thirty. Yeah, interesting. So, um, so you you almost touch on what was Joyce's motive? You said he probably didn't know, but then you did you articulate what you think the motive, the, Joyce's motive was? I think he understood that he was doing what I'm going to call God's work, and that he was just a channel, and he didn't understand what or why, but he knew that this was what he was supposed to do and he was just doing his job as he understood it which was to explode the language for some reason yeah and you know it gave him pleasure but i also think he felt like it was important and meaningful beautiful that's um the word job uh, um 
helps me think of work ethic. Uh -huh. Where'd you get your work ethic from? I don't know that I have one. You're pretty driven. You really yeah, but it's not it's not a, it's not an ethic. It's more like an aesthetic. But, yeah. Yeah, I love exploring job uh, work ethic because you look it up in Wikipedia and about the third paragraph down it says this could be a, a, a scam by capitalist culture. <laughs> it seems like it is. But don't you, where do you think most people get work ethic from? I mean, I think most people are alienated from their desires. So they're doing things that they were told that they should do. Is that things that they want to do? So they don't want to do it. And so they're constantly in a struggle between their actual desire and the, their uh, adopted desire. And so they don't, so the people call that laziness, but it's just alienation, I think. And I think when people have desire, they, they want to. They want to do it. Yeah. How, how, oh, she looks. How do you, um, just navigate that you've done, or no, how do you articulate that you've done that without forming a work ethic? You're calling it a, a more an aesthetic, and your observations that most people or a lot of people are driven by work ethic. How, how did you come to that revelation? Like, how do you think? I mean, I think I have a very low tolerance for alienation. Like, a, like I just I shrivel up very quickly if I'm doing something that's out of alignment with my own natural harmony or flow or yeah. vibrational frequency. So I just can't do it. Like a lot of people are really stoic and they can just withstand like, you know, they can do things that are unpleasant. You know, there was a, in psychology for a while, like that Road Less Traveled book, his whole thing is like, you know, deferred gratification, right? And he's like a, an adult is someone who can defer gratification. You know, and Joyce in his in Finnegan's Wake in the allegory of the moose, uh, you know, the the the, aunt, the grace hop, the grace hopper, and the aunt. I think it's about this question: like, do you have to push yourself to do things, or can you just like allow things to come to you? And I think Joyce believed in the latter. Um, but you sort of go by that too. Yeah, allow things to come to you. But I also work really hard. Uh, so, but I don't do it out of guilt or out of obligation. I just do it out of desire. Are are we more watching it happen or making it happen? Well, in reality, we're watching it happen, but we we think we're making it happen, and we are making it happen. But there's a those two things aren't really aren't really. They're not what? They're not really opposites. They're different. They're different. They're not different. Oh, they're not different. I see. <clears throat> but um, you watch what you're making happen. Yeah. So McLuhan distinguished our extensions, our inventions as extensions. So he would say clothing is an extension of our skin. Knife and fork extends our teeth. The shutter in a camera projector is an extension of our eyelid. What does the moving image camera extend for you? What human sensorium? Humanness. Time. It extends time. Did humans invent time? Well, the, they invented the ability to preserve time and to extend it, yeah. What invention does that? The, ca the movie camera. <laughs> it extends time. Yeah, because tomorrow this will still, I'll still be saying this. And I'm not, it's not going to end just because I said, because time passed. It's like a, it's like a time machine. Right. Cause you're saying that the audio and the camera that are going now have not shut off. I'm That's saying what they, 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 these they're machines. They're preserving will, this moment. They will preserve it. Yeah. Which is funny because my Zoom shut off. <laughs> it did? Yeah, it's a, it has a defect. <laughs> so uh, tell me when 90 minutes is up. Can you tell me? Oh, good. See, you got a great crew here. Thank God. So, um, uh, yeah. So McLuhan said there's no such thing as a good or bad movie. It's a good or a bad viewing experience. Any comment? Um. He's right, of course. 
because if you're drugs, every, on drugs, everything is beautiful. <laughs> so it's not the world that's the problem. That said, within a certain cultural matrix of meaning, some films are better than others. Yeah. Is that called aesthetics? Yeah, it is. But it's also a shared assumptions about what's valuable in, in film, for example. Like, if you value certain kinds of things, uh, Godzilla versus King Kong is a masterpiece. Yeah. If you don't value those things and instead value, I don't know, honesty, for example, then the show about the show is much better. There you go. Is my dinner with Andre honest? It's pretty honest. It's, it's, it's a high honesty quotient for uh, most cinema. Is Finnegan's Wake honest? For, way honest. Too way, honest. Way honest. Dude. Peter Greenway said, Cinema is much too rich a medium to be left to storytellers. Are experimental filmmakers telling stories a different way or doing something completely different? I know it's a stupid question, but it's basically, you watch Tony Conrad's The Flicker, meaning you watch it, we're not, he's not necessarily telling us a story narrative, but we could have a story go through our head. So, well, I think, I think narrative is always present in some form. I mean, Ray Carney, who I think is pretty brilliant, you know, he says like in a Hitchcock film, the, the meaning is actually very intentional and it's never greater than the intentionality of it. Sometimes it exceeds it slightly by chance. Like Vertigo exceeds Hitchcock's intentions, I think. But most Hitchcock films are just their intention manifest. Whereas a film like by Cassavetes, like vastly exceeds its intentionality and its meanings are, are multiple and conflicting all the time. And what Cassavetes does, which is so great, is he creates a space in which contradiction can reverberate. And it's like throwing a, 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 a rock into a pond, like things happen that you aren't controlling. You threw the rock, but the, the effects of that are, you didn't predict that, and it's beautiful. And if you throw a few rocks, then the waves start doing crazy shit. And there's so much more complexity in a Cassavetes film than in a Hitchcock film. And the problem with storytelling is, and certainly Hollywood storytelling that Peter Greenaway is talking about, is that it's always just as smart as the person thinking it. Whereas the great thing about neorealism, for example, as just an instance of something different, is that it's constantly exceeding its intention. And so cinema does that in this great way, if you let it. And that's just a question of setting it up so that um, excess meaning uh, is generated. Dude, you are brilliant. You should be teaching at EGS. <laughs> you will say, I already do. I already do. <laughs> so, yeah, Andrew Norin, you know his films? No. Anyway, it's the experimental filmmaker that slipped by a lot of us. And somehow, uh, it was in P. Adam Sidney's books, Eyes Upside Down. Whatever it's called, Eyes something. Eyes Upside Down. He's yeah, a, he's P. Adam Sidney's book, he's, he quotes him saying... No, narrative is if you put one frame after another, it doesn't matter what's on the frame, that is narrative. Yeah. But Hollis Frampton said uh, that uh, narrative is just the animal spirit in us to because we're, we're waiting to die. Uh -huh. And then McLuhan says that advertises as sex, death, and technology. I say everything is sex, death, and technology. Sex is feeling. Death is time. And technology is anything you put between two people. So, you know, that's it was good how you you sussed out that you know why why do cinema why is it 130 years of cinema is basically filming plays? Yes, it is. And Peter said Peter Greenway said Marty's not doing anything different than D.W. Griffith did basically. Oh, right. better equipment or better anything, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. But it's just filming a play. So why did narrative hijack cinema? Well, I mean, I think narrative is at the center of happiness and unhappiness. Like we're happy because of the stories we tell ourselves and unhappy because of the stories we tell ourselves. And so narrative is kind of the, the battlefield for not only politics, but for human, human happiness and spirituality like, yeah. and, and all ethics. Yeah. So it's important how you frame reality because it will determine how you think about it and what you do about it. Yeah. So if you frame it a certain way, like you talked about enemy, the word enemy, like the answer is, well, kill that guy. <laughs> he's, he's the problem. Yeah. 
If you're in a different way, the answer is love that guy. He needs healing, and that will solve the problem. And so how we view the, the reality that's in front of us and the context we give to it is the art of narrative. And that's what will save us or, or doom us. Yeah. And the problem with Hollywood cinema isn't, is mostly that it's the wrong narrative for our species. Like, our species is... Everything, all the problems in the world are the result of the stories we're telling ourselves. And, the, and mainstream cinema is the repository of those stories. And it's not like it causes it. It's just manifesting stories that we tell ourselves already. But it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful distillation and externalization of those stories. And we see how we think. And what's great about Hollywood is it shows us the collective unconscious. It shows us the what? The collective unconscious. The collective unconscious, yeah. And you go into those movies and you're like, oh, that's what people are thinking and yeah. feeling right now. And like you talked about, you talked about the term uh, hidden... Hidden psychic effects. Yeah. So you see that in, yeah. in cinema very, yeah. very clearly. And the problem with experimental cinema is it's really not addressing that in a way that is very effective. You know, looking at the flickers of black and white, you know, has a place, uh, a very small place in the story of, 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 of man. But, you know, like, we need something more than that. We actually do need a story that, that fills us with, with uh, that makes us dream, right? That makes us dream and stays with us. And here's where Joseph Campbell, I think, is right. Like, the, you know, Marvel, the Marvel Universe is trying to create a story for our times. And, you know, they're doing a pretty good job, actually. And if you think about what they're saying, it's, like, pretty deep and pretty interesting. But it's still very old-fashioned. It's still based on Christian mythology. And it's still not breaking through to the next level, which, which Finning is Wake is trying yes. to do. Yeah. And, you know, people can't read it or don't read it. So it's not very effective either. Like, yeah. he, he went too far in a certain sense, but... Thank someone, God he went too far. <laughs> yeah, thank God. Someone had to do it. And uh, and now, you know, like, we're picking up the pieces of, of the explosion of language that he created and of yeah. meaning. And Peter Greenaway, you know, is coming out of that tradition. Yeah. And I don't like his... Uh, his Cinema at all? Well, I don't like oh. his recent stuff. Oh, no, not his recent stuff. That's but, the, but the early stuff was fantastic. The cl cliche Woody line. I like his early funny stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it applies to every art form and every artist, practically. But you, you touch on so much there because, you know, Christopher Vogler wrote this book, The Writer's Journey. Yeah, I read it. Yeah, he took, he took Campbell because George Lucas and yep. Spielberg, and he made it uh, accessible to Hollywood screenwriters. Then they, they flipped on him and said, you ruined Hollywood. And I goes, well, Campbell got everything he knows from Finnegan's Wake, so James Joyce ruined Hollywood. Thank God. It, was a, it became a 15-year-old white boy's medium, Jaws and Star Wars. Yeah. And so... You know, are you? But you don't give up. You're like Sidney Lumet. He says, "He says, can cinema do anything?" He says, "No, but it ain't going to keep me from trying." Is that is that your attitude? I think cinema can do a lot. I mean, I think my films are doing something important. Good. What are they doing? I mean, I can't even describe it myself because um, I don't even understand what they're but doing. But do you get that from people responding yeah. to your film? That's yeah. it. Yeah. That's how you know they're doing something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and that's, that's not necessarily critics. No. I mean, uh, right. the people here are all here for no money because... They saw your film. Yeah, yeah. and it did something for them. That's so like, You should really ask them what, yeah, that, what it does. Well, well, we'll, we'll, we'll interview each one of them individually. But that's like John Jones, the kid come up to him and said, you know John Jones? Of course. Film. He said, your film helped make me uh, you know, inspired me to join the uh, Occupy movement. He goes, don't blame me. <laughs> but uh, no, that's beautiful. If if Who's your favorite film critic writers of all time? Like uh, Pauline Kael, Manny Farber, who, tell me. Manny what? Farber. Man, Manny Farber. If Manny Farber was reviewing your film and he says, his films are a cross between blah and blah. Who would you feel most honored that he would say was a cross between who and who? I mean, I would say Cassavetes and Godard. Right. Is perception reality? Well, it depends what you mean by those terms. Yeah. So let's say me and you are, are starting the Ann Arbor Film Festival 60 years ago. If cinema's only 130 years, that's pretty good. They've been around for 60 years. 
And uh, George Manupelli, who started it 60 years ago, told me um, that, no, I, I, I'm sorry, let me, George Manupelli started it 60 years ago. Um, what the question is, would you want it to be more inclusive or more exclusive? So I asked this to Chick Strand, even though there's a fraction of animation in documentaries, it's mainly experimental. Have you ever attended Ann Arbor? No, never. Okay. Have you entered? Yeah. Have you gotten in? Yeah. Great. So Chick Strand started Canyon Cinema with Bruce Bailey the same time, about, in San Francisco. She told me they were trying to recreate their 11 cent movie going experience by showing a newsreel, a cartoon, and then an experimental film. Stan Brackage came to him and says, don't show the other stuff. They already got a venue. So should, you know, What's the, you know, what, what would you have leaned towards 60 years ago? Let's be more inclusive or more exclusive? Uh, exclusive. Exclusive and just show experimental. Yeah. Yeah. So what are the services and disservices of ghettoizing experimental film? Jackson Pollock was on the cover of Life magazine 1949. Regular folks could, ex the, could start forming an aesthetic on experimental painting. Bruce Conner and Maya Darren weren't on the cover of Life magazine. Generally, it's privileged, uh, entitled kids who form an aesthetic for experimental film. Any comment? No comment. Do you you have students in Switzerland? You've you've taught experimental film. Have you found that it is privileged? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you're not privileged, you're not going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to be trying to figure out how to make money. Yeah. And, and same with just film in general, in putting experimental film. All the in. arts. I mean, all the arts. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think, you know, thank God Flaubert was rich. Say it again. Thank God Flaubert was rich. Right. Okay. So Michael Apted told me about 30 years ago that I said, why do rock video editors feel so obliged to edit fast? He said, because we've learned to take in information faster. Marty said, oh, I'm cutting my films faster because of MTV. Can we literally, this question is asked with a bias. Can we literally learn to take in information faster or are we just brainwashed to believe these things? I think we are taking information faster, but I think the main reason people are doing that is not because we can take information faster, but because what we're taking in is so shallow and so nothing that we're trying to like hide that with pyrotechnics. Yeah. But the hidden question here is, can humans literally multitask? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, clearly if you focus on something, you'll do, it'll be better. Yeah. <laughs> Marcel Duchamp said there's no art with an, without an audience. How much do you think of your audience when you're making your film? Uh, a lot. I mean, it's a weird, uh, it's a weird paradox because you have to completely ignore the audience on the one hand to 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 speak your truth, you have to speak it despite the audience, but you have to completely let in the audience at the same time, otherwise what you're saying is falling on deaf ears and is irrelevant. So you have to hold these two things together at the same time. It's like African drumming where you have to like listen, and uh, and with one ear and with the other ear you have to. You have to do your thing and keep it. So it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, and I think the best filmmakers find that balance. Um, and then some, you know, there are great filmmakers who just don't. I mean, I think like like the David Lynch period when he was at his best was when he was finding the balance. You know, I, I think Blue Velvet is a film that finds that balance really well. Whereas like, I don't know. Right, I know what you're Mul saying. Mulholland Drive like doesn't find the balance yeah and it's still brilliant but it's not it doesn't have the same yeah I know. how do you rate race her uh, very high over blue velvet yeah because even though it yeah. finds its audience less it's still a better film dude we're destined to meet and i really appreciate this time that was pretty, pretty it's been pretty amazing i appreciate it really um well, what, what do you think the motive of the cave artist was? Not what Herzog said in his film or anthropologist, but your hunch. To 
not feel so small? What's more important, conviction or compromise? Conviction. You've accomplished a lot. How would you rate these three elements, luck, skill, and ambition? What played the biggest role, second or third? Luck, ambition, skill. T.S. Eliot said poetry is outing your inner dialogue. What language is your inner dialogue in? English. What form is your inner consciousness in? What form? Yeah. Guilt. Ah! <laughs> Sorry for that. One. So, <laughs> no, the, the language is a guilt. <laughs> you know, a Abigail Chow, uh -huh. she says, what form, what, what language is your inner dialogue in? She goes, I wish I knew. <laughs> Can we ask these guys the question that you asked earlier? Oh, well, why don't we, yeah, I, I would love to open it up, but let's, could we um, finish your, you know, interview sure. and then we could do whatever you want. Sure. Does, I'm working on a new question. You can help, you know, is the basic instinct to do the right thing, is the artists have a moral obligation is sort of what I'm leaning towards. So I'm all, these questions are always in a morphing stage and always I'm trying to work on, you know, but maybe you can help me. What's the best way to ask that question or is that fine? Does the artist have a moral obligation? I think the question is fine. Um, I think the artist has a moral obligation to himself. Right. Does the audience have a moral obligation to the artwork? No. No. It's sort of like John Waters rooting for the Wicked Witch of the West. You know, we all, did you root for the... No, I like Dorothy. Yeah. <laughs> so is that like wrong or bad? No. No. Yeah. But do uh, movies create false expectations? Yes. Is there anything we can do about that? We can try to make movies that militate against that. Militate? What does that mean? Well, like in a that fight against that. Right. Like I, I don't, I don't like to watch movies with blood or guns or gun, uh, you know, that uh, violence. But, but is that just a re like? Does well, like you like it's complicated, right? No, oh, well, that's not really. No, I mean, no, but, it was okay. But I like it too. Yeah. But, but I mean, that film is a film that tries to militate against false expectations. Yeah. yeah. And to sort of help us to accept yeah. the way things are. Yeah. And that's what's good about it. I mean. Right. I, I understand what you're saying, but it's like this. I'll go to Kubrick for a second. Um, do, does a violent film like Clockwork Orange more alleviate humans of any violent tendency or cause kids to go beat up winos? Here's the, the basic question. Stanley pulled clockwork for 30 years off of UK screens only because the UK cops came to him and says, pull your film. Your film's causing kids to beat up winos or beat up people. He did it. Did he do it because he knew it was sort of like a good PR stunt? Or, you know, that's sort of overwording it. Or did he do it because he really felt that his film was causing people to beat up other people? I don't know why he did it, but um, I think if it was causing people to beat up other people, they were already wanting to beat up other people, and they just found, like, the form right. for that. But they would have found a different form if, right. if he hadn't made that film. Right, even more so, did Louis Budwell bring rocks in his pocket to the screening of either Anshan du Lodge Door to help start the riot or to protect himself when they said, he's the filmmaker, get him. <laughs> this is guessing. I'm not asking you, you know, but what do you guess? Uh, Budwell? Yeah. The, the second. To protect himself? Yeah. Oh, that's... Well, because, you know, I had James Harris, who produced like eight films with Kubrick, sitting right in that very chair answering all these questions. And he said Stanley was two things, film and family. He wouldn't go that Stanley knew that it was probably a good sellable thing. Well, why, why pull it in UK screens only? You could go buy bootleg copies of VHS Clockwork Orange on the streets of London, mm -hmm. you know. 
Why is it so difficult for humans to consider the possibility that life may be pointless? I'm not saying life is pointless. I'm saying why is it so difficult for humans to consider the possibility that it might be pointless? I think most people struggle with the the sense that it is pointless and they feel a hopeless yeah. and depressed. And so they're trying really hard not to fall into total despair and suicide. Yeah. Lewis Carroll says, I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Have you believed in any impossible things lately? Well, I think, I think life is kind of impossible. Life is impossible, yeah. You know what uh, Sun Ra said, the impossible attracts me because everything possible has been done and the world did not change. <laughs> Tell me one major element of your films that's changed. How many years have you been making? About three decades? Uh -huh. Yeah. One major element of your films that has changed and one major element that stayed the same in the 30 years. Well, when I started, I didn't care about the audience reaction as much. So I've, I've become much more, um, I try much harder to, uh, to compel the viewer's attention. Um, so that's changed. I guess what hasn't changed is I'm still trying to tell the story of my life as it unfolds in an, as honest a way as I can. Again, where did this desire and need to be honest come from for you? Is it the way your parents raised you? No. How did you get that? It was gradual. It wasn't like I woke up one day and I was... I know, but I mean, <laughs> could you just suss it out a little? Is there is there points in your life that were like, I had a revelation or, I mean. I think I just, I just realized that like not being honest was less fun. And there was a pleasure I get, uh, an ease. Wallace Stevens says there is an ease like being on a boat at sea. Who says that? Wallace Stevens. Oh, the poet Wallace Stevens says in a poem. Yeah. That there's a what? There's an ease that was like being on a boat at sea. And I feel like being honest is like that. There's just an ease. There's just like you just, if you're honest, the waves just carry you. And there's an ease to that. Whereas not being honest is kind of like like trying to row off and upstream. Um, and it's tiring. On what occasion do you lie? Uh, I lie uh, when I feel like being honest is going to get me in trouble. Uh, and I don't want to deal with it right this minute. Yeah. <clears throat> Voshi Feldenkrais works with healing and movement. He says it's literally possible to identify a weakness and incorporate it to become a strength. Rather, we're taught to overcome a weakness. Can you tell me a weakness that you've incorporated to become a strength? Um, well, I think not knowing. Is a weakness? Well, it's seen that as a weakness. That desire to be, not know. The, 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 uh, Ignorance is considered a weakness in our culture. And you've made it a strength how? By, by leaning into it and by acknowledging that I am ignorant, and so is everyone else, and that that's okay. And so you're actually going to get a lot further. You're going to learn more if you uh, don't assume you know what something means than if you assume you do. I mean, it was just like vocabulary words. You know, there's so many words that we sort of know what they mean, but we're not sure. Yeah. And most people would rather, like, assume they know, even if they're wrong, yeah. than, uh, than, posit than just yeah. double check. Yeah. And the ones who double check are the ones who actually learn the word. And the rest of us all just live in this sort of limbo of, like, I sort of know what it means, but I'm not really sure, but yeah. I think I do. Whereas I think I don't. Yeah. I, uh, I'm addicted to etymology online. Because I just want to know where a word came from. And that doesn't mean that's what it means now. Because like fake news used to be called satire news on Wikipedia. And then it changed over the last five or six years. And, and McLuhan so well put, fake and fact are both from the same Latin word to make. <laughs> so yeah, and again, uh, you touch on something that resonates big in my life as Frank Zappa saying stupidity is a building block of the universe. That, you know... Uh, people think it's other things. What's the difference between stupidity and ignorance? 
Well, ignorance is just not knowing. Stupidity is is a uh, is thinking you do. Why are his films important to you? They've encouraged me to be more honest. They're really fun. Um, it's a great balance between having fun and trying to be a more honest, feeling, knowledgeable person. He is a um, less um, scary version of my dad. Very good. Why is this? Why are his films important to you? I actually haven't seen any of Kaveh's films. Uh, I've only seen the show about the show. Um, and I've listened to his podcast. Um, and uh, uh, well, what I love about the show about the show is, uh, is the brutal honesty, uh, which is, I guess, sort of what everybody says. <laughs> but um, uh, I also love just the dedication to, um, to the art form. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, when there's that dedication to really anything, that's what, uh, inspires me. And, um, and the podcast I like because it's very easy to listen to. It's very, the episodes are incredibly short. <laughs> um, but, uh, it's, um, there's no point necessarily to the stories. It's whatever you choose to take away from them. Uh, but Kave doesn't like um, praise, so <laughs> I'd imagine he doesn't like any of this. <laughs> but that's uh, that's what I get. Very okay. good. What inspires you about his films and his TV shows and his podcast? Um, I like that it feels like his life is one big art project, and we get to watch it. Um, <laughs> and it sometimes it does feel like a cautionary tale of like being too radically honest but I think it has made me want to be more honest in my life and not worry about people's reactions to it as much here do you want me to yeah sure and I guess I need that mic mm -hmm. I can also just I mean if you wanted to you do these um based on what you just said mm -hmm. um instead of passing around the mic I could also just hold this shotgun if you, that's if you wanted to like redo our answers. Unless if anyone has anything different they want to say. <laughs> or say I mean, not necessarily that I do agree that it feels kind of uh, staged. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it technically is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is staged. Yeah. Maybe it's just a bad idea. <laughs> I don't think it's inherently bad. I don't think it's, yeah, I don't think it's inherently bad either. I guess it's just. Well, why are you. We have maybe make it more of a, make it more of a conversation than, um, than a directed question, perhaps. Maybe we could each say why we like it's complicated. Oh, that maybe. <laughs> okay. Cool. I mean, the worst thing for uh, for the show is just positivity. I mean, it's not the worst thing. Tale. Yeah, I know, <laughs> but it's like. Uh, it can't feel like it's like a... I know. Yeah. So it's just like... A, but it's not... You don't want it to be fake ne negativity either. It just has to be like the right balance of true. Mm -hmm. So... You did ask three people that um are working for you for free. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore. We're more likely to say good stuff about it. Yeah, but I mean, the real image, right? So the real question is like, why are you working for free? I want to be a part of something that I like. I want to help make art that I think is cool. Um, and it's uh, probably preferable than donating money myself. Good answer. <laughs> why, 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 why are you working for free? I, I'm, on, I'm doing this because um, I'm intrigued by you as a person. <laughs> because it's, uh, and that's not necessarily a compliment. Don't get me wrong. Um, it's uh i mean i don't want to insult but you know you're kind of like a ridiculous person in in a in a very interesting way and uh and i thought it'd be interesting to meet you as well as um you know you asked for sound person i do sound so i thought it was you know it worked <laughs> but uh what are you getting out of it though um 
Okay, well, um, on a very practical level, a credit, I guess, in uh-huh. your show. Um, but more so getting to another experience, just getting to meet you and see what you're like in person <laughs> after what? watching your show. Uh-huh. Yeah. What about you? What am I getting out of it? Yeah, yeah. A chance to see if you're really like what you act like you are in your in all your media and i'd say yeah it's also a fun story to tell you went Uh to the same high school as me we played tennis that was fun yeah could i ask a question you you mentioned how positivity positivity is inherently bad and you sort of were saying that are, are you saying that honesty is typically not positive from your experience no, it's just like, uh, you know, it's like if you have a glass of water and it's half full or half empty, you can say this glass is half full. Or you can say this glass is half empty. And if you say it's half empty, that's actually a more interesting thing to make a film about. Hmm. Um, there so is entertainment is, is better when you focus on... Which is the, the, the edge of what's... I mean, films are about what's wrong. They're not about what's right. And you look at, like, you go to the edge of something that's wrong. And you're like, why is this wrong? How do you, and what do you do about this wrongness? It's, it's, it's just not the same thing to be like, this is so right. I mean, there's something beautiful and transgressive about love and about the good. That, that's a harder bar. Like, it's harder to con- do that well. It's harder to talk about how great things are and have it be compelling than how fuck things are and have it be compelling. So I actually want to talk about how great things are. Uh, in this episode, but it's just tricky. Uh, so that's all I was saying was that inherently, glass half empty is a better uh, cinematic attitude than glass half full. But in life, glass half full is much better for happiness. Do you feel like you don't allow yourself to be happy when a camera's rolling? Or you also don't necessarily have to point that at you because you have that mic. Oh, and right. You want to hear. Absurd. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the question? Do you feel like you, it's harder for you to be happy when you have a camera rolling? No, you bring think, a camera in your life everywhere. No, no, I actually am happier when a camera's rolling. Because I feel like it's not for nothing. Like, life is happening and it seems like it's for nothing. And it's just disappearing. It's just disappearing all the time. It's like dying. Everything's dying every moment. Every moment is dying. And if you have a camera, it's not dying. So it's just like, it's like a little ambulance that keeps you from dying. So it's to per- preserve those moments, like you were saying earlier, yeah. to preserve time. Yeah. Do you feel like you live in the moment when you have a camera on you? Or are you living in the editing room or thinking about, you know, what's the best thing to say? I mean, you're always doing that. Um, I think there's like a, there's a, there's a, there's a balance between, between stress and ease that is the right balance for all of us. Like if we have too much ease, we're just kind of like fall asleep, right? But if we too much stress, we're just not, we're not, well, that's not good. So where is that place where you're like at enough ease that you can sort of be happy-ish, but have enough stress that you're sort of striving still. And the camera like does that. It gives me the stress of striving, but also the ease of knowing that it's, it's preserved somehow. And I have to control it or like it's something, it's, I just think it's good to preserve things. I honestly though feel like typically, at least from what I've experienced today, when you're talking with somebody, you're very in tune with that person, you're very present, you know, direct eye contact and you seem to be listening very intently. But it's interesting to hear that you think that every moment is dying because, you know, a lot of people talk about being present and how, I mean, difficult that is and it seems like you do it fairly well. Um, But that you feel like each moment is dying regardless of how much of yourself you're giving to that moment. I mean, we're all dying, right? Yeah. And yet there's something eternal that is also happening. So we're always in both eternity and, and t- time at the same time. And I think cinema is a good, is a good uh, emblem or symbol of the simultaneity of death and eternity. So it seems to me like uh, that's what cinema brings. It's like it brings that, those two things together. Uh, usually we're ignoring death or we're ignoring eternity or we're ignoring both <laughs> but this has both in it you know like and I, I like that space of 
both death and eternity, like simultaneously present here. You know, I, you, like I have kids, you know, you see the kids are growing and every day they're different. And there's something sad about that. You know, like the kid that was there yesterday is gone, but there's this new kid and, and, and they will die completely, but maybe they'll have kids too. And it's just like, So with every moment that you experience, a part of yourself dies and a new part is almost discovered? Because, I mean, with kids, right, as, as they grow up, that's what, that, that's what I heard, I guess, is that I mean, we're all dying, and... When you have kids, there's a whole feeling level about it that is different than your own death or your friend's deaths or your lover's death. But it's like, it's, it's always there. Like, you know they're going to die. And so, and you want to take pictures of your children because they're going to die. I think why you're attracted to Finnegan's Wake is because that is the history of everything that's ever happened and ever will happen, and it's that humans fall, then they get back up. It's the, it's redemption. So that's what he, you know, you guys really came through for me because in my 90-minute interview, if either I or the person tears up, I know it went well. And it is knowing that the word in Finnegan's Wake is laugh tears. So he took two letters, A and S, which means metaphor, all language is metaphor, as, and he put them into the word laughter and made it laugh tears. You cry and you laugh. You laugh and you cry. That's the human condition. So, you know, if you understand that that is the human condition, then you can embrace your falling as much as you can embrace your getting back up you know I think what you said was really important because Jean Rouge the French documentarian film theorist said if I put a camera between me and you it's more true than if there's no camera now most people would go that's stupid no and so how do we navigate that I think that's what you've done you navigate how do I capture the human experience the difference in documentary filmmaking is direct cinema or cinema verite you know one is fly on the wall observational cinema and one is fly in the soup I'm in it I'm in this film and you know your respect for Frederick Wiseman came out clear the guy has no added music no added anything and he knows, I've talked to him, he says, it's reality fiction. He still knows it's not capturing reality. But since we've all been raised without, that we, we've never been without film, we don't know world without film. So there's no, you know, nothing to compare it to. I have a question for you. Can you forget to die? I mean, I'm not sure that everyone says, you know, I mean, it seems like we all die. But there, there are schools of thought that say that we, we don't have to. Right. Which I think is an interesting concept. Yeah. Um, and it, again, like, I don't know if we all have to die. Everyone, everyone seems to have died, whoever lived, <laughs> except maybe Jesus. Yeah. And maybe that's, the, that's an option. Right. Well, do you mind if I read you this? Because this is some something that tackles that very subject. It says, Objects are unobservable. Only relationships amongst objects are observable. So if you think that the question, will we ever learn, implies a goal or a particular point or time we'll re arrive at, we'll never know that. Because objects don't exist only in relations amongst other objects. 
It's like asking, will there ever be silence? It's like asking, will you ever die? Well, you'll never know because to be dead is, is a specific experience that seems to imply isolation, which could not be known. Because nothing exists in isolation, you will never experience death. You will only experience those things that involve relationships. The end point of time, death cannot be experienced because it's not a relationship among events. No, we don't know. I think you've answered that on a YouTube interview I was just watching. You mm -hmm. know, they asked you, what's, what, what do you believe in life after death? And you really articulated it well. Because we're dying every second. It just depends on how you define what death is. You know. Is, is cinema death? Or is it life? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's both. It's yeah, nice it's both. About it. That's my question is, how do you embrace contradiction? How did you learn and in, in, in basically embrace um. the duality? You know. I think hallucinogens. Uh, you think what? Hallucinogens. Right, right. Yeah. And that's connected to dream, you know, I think. You know, Harry Smith said the purpose of cinema was to put people to sleep. And it's like we, and you go to... His, his cinema. Yeah, yeah, that's... <laughs> but, but uh, you know... Uh, Yoko Ono says, if you dream a dream alone, it's a dream. But if you dream a dream with other people, it's reality. Mm. So we all go into a movie theater. We're sort of dreaming together, aren't we? Mm -hmm. You know, so we, we think it's reality. Well, we're all dreaming together all the time. All the time anyways. Anyway, yeah. 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 Well, do you mind if we just flow into this end? It, it yeah. was really beautiful. I, I really appreciate you. Um, opening up like that that was uh, truly an emotional moment for me a anger can be a productive emotion when fill in the blank when it's when you really feel it yeah and you let yourself feel it yeah and don't try to repress it yeah well I, I'm curious about that word repress because it seems as though you've develop some techniques how not to repress things that the, the important thing is to let things out how how and why you know why how did you come about that's a good way for you and how does it work i don't know i think like allow allowing is a very powerful spiritual tool i guess and it's like I guess I think that, like, you talked about the journey and destination, like, allowing is what gets you to where you need to go without even knowing where you, go, where you, where you need to go. It just yeah. you go there automatically if you allow what you're feeling to lead you. Yeah. And I think we all have feelings, and they're our guidance system. They're our GPS, and we ignore them because we're taught to suppress them. Yeah. And then we end up going some destination that is not really... It's where we think we should go or we want to go, but it's not where our being is moving us to go. And I think where our being has more wisdom than our minds, and our job is to follow that wisdom. And I don't know, I just feel like better things happen Yeah. when, when, you, when you allow what is yeah. instead of trying to make what you want happen. Yeah, you sort of already answered this, but it's interesting. <coughs> I, <coughs> I asked this question about how George Manupelli, his mantra is, there is no self, uh, uh, ignore yourself. Jonas Mika says, there's no self-expression. Cecil Taylor says, I'm just a vehicle and this stuff just comes through me. So the question was, I would ask is, are artists or filmmakers more course it's both and it depends but are they more self-expressing or are they more just vehicles for whatever technology or culture is currently present well they're both at the same time right but i mean i think we're all manifestations of god and we're all unique manifestations of god so we're all god expressing god's self yeah and at the same time 
we're all channeling God. So the question is, whose self is our self-expressing? And, you know, I think we're either expressing our ego self, which I would call, well, you used the word evil. Right, right. And, or we're expressing God, which I would call the good. Yeah. And that's when we're happy, when we're expressing that part. And most of us are often falling victim to the delusion that our self that's separate from God and others is the self that we want to express against others and in opposition to others and to be better than and special to, to, than others. I mean, you talked about, you know, filmmakers that, you know, are overrated. I mean, on some level, that's just like uh, an agon between egos. Yeah. And really, it's like everyone is trying to, to express God in their own way. Yeah. And some of us are, I don't know, I don't know if we're doing a better job. Like, we're just doing it differently. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah, just, it's just a jumping off point. I, I don't like to, you know, rate people and say someone's better than another. But just in simple terms, it's like a jumping off point to start a discussion. Sure. Because the question really is, is can art making be egoless? I think it, it can. Yeah. There's no right or wrong answers to any of these questions, but that one you got right. <laughs> but I also think that's what art is. Yeah. Art is egolessness yeah. in motion. Yeah. People have told me, great. Most people say, no, their art has to have ego. And I say, and sometimes people go, great art is egoless. Yeah. That's the universality that it touches a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Was Freud right? About what? <laughs> you answered a question with a question. You win. That, that was great. In general, just your it, opinion. It, I think his, his discovery that there is an unconscious that we are not aware of, that is operative, and yeah. that is calling the shots, was like fun, incredibly important yeah. discovery for humanity. Yeah, so. but it seems it goes back to that thing. Did he discover, create the disease and offer the cure? You have repression. You're repressing this. I have the cure for you. No. No. I think that was going on for a long time. Yeah. And he just found a name for it. Called psychoanalysis? Well, it's just called the unconscious. Oh, I see. Yeah. <clears throat> Which enabled us to sort of look at it with a new map yeah. and a new narrative yeah. that enables us to get a handle on it yeah. that we didn't have before. How do you find peace of mind? Peace of mind. Um, surrender to what's happening. That's good. If you were walking down the street today and you met yourself as a 12-year-old, what would you say to your 12-year-old self? Um, you're a great kid. <laughs> that is you really are are you more an optimist or more a pessimist pessimist are you really <laughs> i would say you're you're a opt you're you're a positive human being but you're disguised as a pessimist would you say that's it sure yeah so there's a line that goes you create what you resist bob goldthwaite morphed it into you are what you hate and Joyce said, it's a curious thing how your mind is supersaturated with the religion in which you say you disbelieve. Louis Bunuel nailed it. He said, thank God I'm an atheist. What's your feelings about this line, you create what you resist? Not you, but this the general thought. One creates what one resists. Well, I think resisting anything uh, empowers it yeah. and makes it more, more strong. Yeah. So I think, you know, again, the Tao would just say water is stronger than the rock. Um, and that by letting by by letting it happen, it, yeah. it conquers in time. Yeah. Could we do these five quick Alan Watts questions? They're just like asking for, you know, uh, three to five words and they're just really short. Who sure. started it all? Um, the desire for specialness. Are we going to make it? Yes. Where do we put it? In our hearts. Who's cleaning it up? We are. Is it serious? It's so much more serious than we can imagine. Nice. <laughs> <laughs>
That was really well done. So um, Utah Phillips says anarchy is making rules for yourself and not other people. Who's entitled to make the rules? I think everyone needs to make the rules for themselves that they want to live by at that moment and change them when they're ready to have new rules. Yeah. I don't think anyone's rules can apply to anyone else. What's the difference between rights and responsibilities? One sounds good and one sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> which is which? Well, right sounds better than responsibility. <laughs> Tarkovsky was uh, introduced by Stan Brackage at Telluride in 83. He said, I personally think that the three greatest tasks for film in the 20th century are one, to make the epic that is to tell the tales of the tribes of the world. This is Brackage talking or Tarkovsky? Yes, this is Bra Brackage introducing Tarkovsky. First is make the epic tell the tales of the tribes of the world. Two, keep it personal because only in the eccentricities of our personal lives do we have any chance at the truth. Three, to do the dream work that is to illuminate the borders of the unconscious. Any comments on what would your 21st century updates be? That's pretty great. Yeah. Uh, I think he's... He we, nailed we, it. We haven't done that yet. Yeah, we're trying. So, um, if you were... Um, uh, uh, what's the function of poetry? Since you studied, po you know, Mahler, man, I'm really impressed. What's the function of poetry? Yeah. Um, I don't know, poetry just uh, heals the wound. See, Leo Bersani's Mahler May study said the very crises which threatens the writing of poetry sustains poetic composition. Do you know what that means, or can you suss that out? The very crises that... That threatens the writing of poetry uh -huh. sustains poetic composition. I think so. Do you want me to translate it? Yeah, what, what does that mean to you? It's an I mean, intriguing to, line to me. To me, the crises are like, you know, the, the modern world. Yeah. And all of its alienation, right, is a crisis. And yet, that's what is also the, the thing that damns it is the thing that saves it, right? Yeah. It's always true. It like, it's the very thing that's the problem that is also the solution. Yeah. And, and we have to inhabit that crisis and problem fully to find a new place because things are different than they were before the crises and we can't use the old forms we have to find new forms for the for the present moment yeah it, it reminds me of maybe somewhat the motive of your show is to use your show the crises of your show to be the composition of the show yeah it's manipian satire that's what that's that, what Manipian satire is when you use the very medium you're in to come. Like satire is just making fun of something else. Manipian satire is using the medium, like Finnegan's Wake, it's language about language. Manipian was a Roman playwright? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, you know, Rabelais, Lewis Carroll, you know, everything these your crew grew up on, South Park, Simpsons whatever they grew up on, everything is manipulating satire now, uh -huh. you know. But it is commenting on the very form, uh -huh. you know, and using the form, you know, as part of the satire. You know, you use your skill as a filmmaker to comment on filmmaking, you know, and... Uh, well, Stevens says all poetry is about poetry. Who it. says that? Well, Stevens. Really? All poetry is about poetry, yeah. That seems true to me. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Gary Snyder says that the task of the poet is to see the world without language and then put that seeing into language. What's more fundamental, language or music? Language. Wow. Can you, I already, did I ask you, can you think without language? You just asked me that. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, just a couple more if you don't mind. Is that all right? Uh-huh. If a publisher to what was to release your autobiography off the top of your head, what would the title be? Um, a journal of the year in which I wrote this journal. And they want to scent the glue in the binding. What smell would it be? Um, 
wet dog. <laughs> D-O-G? Yeah. Oh, that is great. It's a great visual. You see him, you know, shaking in the water coming up. If a statue was built in your honor, where would you want it displayed, and what would it be made of? Uh, it would be made of uh, clay, <laughs> and it would be displayed underground. Underground. Tell me something good you never had and you never want. Uh, something good you never had, you never want. Um, to climb Mount Everest? It's good, you never had it, and you never want it. You know the three most popular answers to that question? No. Fame, money, and heroin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you were in a vat of vomit up to your neck and someone threw a bag of shit at your face, what would you do? <laughs> despair. Despair? <laughs> what does despair mean? What do you mean by that? I would just feel really hopeless. So Joseph Boys, you know he wrote an extra chapter to Finnegan's Wake? I do. Yeah. And he said, make the secrets productive. Lou Welsh, beat poet, ad man, he said, guard the secrets, but constantly reveal them. But as Thornton Wilder in 28, awaken himself, Art is confession. Art is the secret told. But art is not only the desire to tell one secret, it's the desire to tell it and hide it at the same time. You've laid your cards on the table for 90 minutes. I'm not insinuating you haven't answered this. What's it really all about for you? Just doing the work of God. And then how would you define what God is? Who God is? Small G or uh, capital G? Capital G. Yeah. I mean, how would you put that into words if someone said who is God or what is God? God is the energy of love that permeates and creates the universe. Yeah. What's the healthiest, thank you, what's the healthiest cultural impactful cultural shift you see developing today healthiest impactful cultural shift yeah like i usually say healthiest cultural shift but people think it means health of the body oh, yeah, yeah. but i mean in general like a general cultural shift it can be health of the body or you know i think there's like a, a distrust of media that's th that that has developed yeah. yeah which has a negative side but also i think ultimately a positive side right well that's funny because i think people's fear of oh my god that's disinformation that's fake news i mean what's this uh, new thing called deep fakes where they oh i was going to ask you this specifically this is a good example so the new morgan neville doc about the great chef anthony bourdain who committed suicide, they took his voice, oh, yeah. fed it in to You're talking this yesterday. Yeah, AI, and then they don't credit that they said they they that it's not really his voice. Would you think it's better to put it in the end credits or not necessary? For sure. Put it in not in the end credits, put it in right in when it's happening. When it's happening. <laughs> yeah. See so it's just like Kurtzog pays people in his documentaries to do things. Yeah. Is that is that okay? No. Yeah. Not for me. I yeah. mean, I think it'd be more interesting if we saw him pay them. Why yeah. not add that? Yeah. Yeah. So if if you're filming a documentary on Brazilian street kids and one of them starts beating the shit out of the other, do you put the camera down and save the kids or do you film it because you, that's your role is to tell the world about this? Intervene or, or keep filming? Well, maybe you can intervene without turning the camera off. <laughs> That's, good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So it's back to that moral obligation. I mean, that's what that I mean. My last question to you, and then we could I could ask them a couple questions in, that, in this regard. That's all right. If you want. Okay. What gives you the most optimism? That babies are born every day. Most people say youth. Yeah, very good. 
Um, so do you think that Morgan should have said that that, that was AI speaking? Yeah, definitely. It's dishonest. Yeah. But isn't all art dishonest? You know, Picasso said, art is a lie that tells the truth. But this is kind of masquerading as being more honest. Right. You know, but, but it, it goes to who, who makes the masquerading more honest rules? The viewer? Or do you think it's the artist? Well, no, you're answering a question with a question. That's good. So is it up? That's like back to, is the artist have a moral obligation? I mean, you know, that's the, I'm not trying to rationale negativity, lying, cheating, but isn't that what all art is? Or is it the opposite? No, I think there is a lie at the heart of the truth, and there's a truth at the heart of a lie, yeah. but it's finding that balance which is, most deeply true, however, whatever lie surrounds it, right. and there are there are there are degrees of that, and people can feel it when it's got a higher truth quotient, or when it's got a lower truth quotient. Right. So, like somebody like Pasolini makes really radical, difficult films. Are is he the type of artist that's pushing it to the edge so that we? Like, without deviation, progress is not possible, as Ben said. So, he, I mean, Pasolini is great. He's a great artist. Right. So it's like, who, who navigates that? Like he said, the, the viewer. So it's up to the viewer to take whether the artist goes too far or not. Yeah. 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 I mean, it doesn't matter what the viewer thinks, but they're the ones who are going to decide for themselves. I mean, there's no, no one has the, the final say the last word on it it's just well that's what rules and laws are they do have the final say yeah, that's what the gatekeepers yeah, are I know but they change every few years the rules yeah um can we stop now yeah thank you <laughs> sure <laughs>